Uh, I'm Gary Wagner. I'm one of the principals at Carnegie. So thank you for coming. Continue our Carnegie College series. And um, for those of you that haven't been here yet, uh, welcome. And we do these e just about every uh, month, the second Wednesday, depending on when that falls, um, or the holiday or something. But mm. so. Um, important part of it is we try to uh, develop the content based on feedback. So afterwards, we're going to have a quick survey. So just give us uh, ideas if, you, if there's any other topics you want us to cover. We'd be happy to do that um, in future future events. The uh, topic today, um, by the way, it was so Art did a market update. Art Merriman, who I'll introduce in a second, did. A similar update almost to the day six months ago, October 14th, and um, 15 or 14. October date, well, it was October 14th of 15th, and um, the uh, couple, couple things to note about that one one was it was the most well attended. Carnegie College event ever, so looks like we're actually going to top that. Today. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the uh, video, thanks to Justin back there, we uh, record all of these, and it was the most downloaded or requested video as well, by far. So, um, no pressure on Art to uh, <laughs> top that, but um, you know. It's interesting if you look at the market. Anybody have a, an idea if the market's higher or lower than when the last time Art, Art spoke? So it was October 14th. Higher. Higher? Yeah. It basically, it, it, it actually, the market's up 5%. Um, but you wouldn't know, you know, it certainly felt like uh, a lot different than that if you look at what happened this year. and. It's been extremely volatile, so you know, point to point, it's relatively flat. But there was a lot going on in between, and um, I think we're probably going to have that continue. But he's going to share more about that. So, without uh, holding back any longer, I'd like to introduce Art Merriman. Who, uh, thanks, Gary. Thanks, everybody, for coming. So, I think this. I'm going to put this over. Um, this is a little harder environment to do a review in because. Six or back in October, um, things were kind of extended, and it was just the charts and everything looked. It was just sort of easier to take a snapshot of what was going on and 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 look forward. And now everything's, I think, kind of in no man's land. But um, so what I'm going to do today is just I have a. It's basically all charts, and uh, I like to use charts because it's kind of like a picture paints a thousand words, and you can really see a good snapshot of what's going on. Um, and just try to highlight some of the things, you know, sort of where we are and some other things that have been happening, maybe a little bit under the hood that you might not have heard about and, and sort of maybe to be able to point out a few things you might not have realized or seen in the, in the press. And then um, talk about a couple things that we think are, are good areas to look at for investing. And then maybe just wrap it up with a few, po there's, there's a lot of positives in the market and there's a lot of negatives too. So um, that's what we'll try to cover. And I got this. Pointer I'm going to use cost me three dollars. So I'm going to use it. Um, so this is the S&P 500. Um, it's actually the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF. And what I wanted to point out here is that we've had um, as good as this rally's been in the last month or so. We've had a trend change in the market, which we haven't had for about um, almost six years. You can see this is a three-year chart, but you can see how, how smooth an uptrend this was. And this blue line right here is, is the 200-day moving average. And the 200-day moving average is probably the most uh, reliable indicator of trend change that there is. Um, and you can see right here where it turned down, and it's, it's negative sloping. This chart's a couple days old, so this, the, the market's actually up, up almost to this downtrend channel again. So we're, when I say we're right in no man's land, it's, it's made this big rally back but it hasn't really broken out. It's, it's actually right on the numbers right now. So it's, you know, it, a lot of people think time to sell because it's going to go back down into this, into this trading range within a downtrend. But on the other hand, if it breaks up and continues, if it breaks through and holds for a few days, that's a very positive sign. So 
the jury's really out. I mean, like right today, we're right back at the number. So we might even get a, a trend change indicator after today's close or tomorrow or something, you know, something close to that. This is, uh, we use Strategus Research out of New York and they're really, really good uh, technical guys and they've got a, a, a trend model and you can see all through these last, you know, six years it's been a positive trend, it's really smooth, pretty easy, you know, like, almost like shooting fish in a bucket, you buy stocks and then they're, they're going to go up. But the trend changed here and right now it's in, it's in neutral territory, it's been negative for quite a while this year, but it's Again, the, the no man's land is back and forth. You can't really tell what's happening. This is a five um, a five uh, trend model, five you know, factor model, and three of them are positive. So they need one more to flip to positive before this would change, would go positive again. So again, it's very close, and I think it's probably going to go positive again. But um, we've been more cautious because we want to wait for these signals. They can fool you sometimes. Wait, actually, go back for one second, Gary. You can see here, this is 08, what happened here, and how long it was in a negative. But then there's a couple of false signals in here, which back and forth just like it is here. Mm -hmm. So the jury's kind of out still. Um, one of the things we've seen that's a positive is the number of 65 day highs, which is an important indicator of internal momentum and strength, um, has finally expanded above above the 30% level, which is a, a really important level, and you can see it hasn't hasn't gone above that for about 15 months. So when Gary was talking about the market being sort of going nowhere, that's what's happened, but we've seen one of these important indicators break through now, and that's probably one of the most positive signs sort of under the hood for the, that would argue for the market starting to go higher and, and resume an uptrend. Um, however, what's happening in the bond market too, because you can't really make a very good assessment of what's happening or with the valuation in the stock market without considering where interest rates are. And this is the, a chart of the 10-year uh, treasury yield. So you can see yields are back down to about 1.7%, 1.8%. So if you put your money in treasuries, risk-free assets for 10 years, you get 1.7% taxable. So it's, you basically get very, very little, but you can see how clear a downtrend that's been in. So interest rates are really, really low, and on a relative basis, that makes stocks more attractive because you basically can't get anything out of bonds. <clears throat> and this is um, just to, to show you what's happening globally. It's not just the U.S. rates that are low. Germany's low, Sweden's low, France is low, Japan's negative. All these numbers are fractions of 1%. So they're, you know, all these 10-year <coughs> yields are down less than 1% globally. So actually, our rates relative to the rest of the world are a little bit high. And that's why part of the reason we've had so much dollar strength. But it's a worldwide phenomenon because all the central banks are just reducing rates, printing money to try to juice the economy, their, their economy that hasn't worked very well, but that's what's happening. Um, so that th those points are just kind of the snapshot of where the market is, where rates are. Um, and I wanted to go through a few things that have been happening in the last month or so that have changed, where, where we've seen some trend changes that I think are really interesting. Um, one of them is with oil. We've been in this huge oil downtrend, everybody knows it. You fill your tank with gas, it's been really cheap and now it's, get, now it's going up about two bucks again. But uh, this is West Texas Intermediate and it's been in this huge downtrend and right now it's back right about to $40. It's broken through its 200 day moving average, so there's a little bit of positive, you know, some people think it's over, but it's still, it's still right against this downtrend. And um, you know we're going to see what happens, but uh, I think it's really interesting that 18 months ago, you probably couldn't find an analyst on Wall Street who wasn't predicting 100 to 150 dollar oil. Everybody was in that sort of model. Goldman Sachs went to 200 and they even said 300 at one point, and then this happened. And about a month or two ago, all these guys threw in the towel and started saying 20 dollar oil. <laughs> it was the same guys that were saying 118 months ago, and I, I thought at the time, a bunch of us thought actually here that that was a good signal that it was probably, the worst was probably over for oil, not these guys that, who were so wrong are now saying 20, and then they got in a little contest, who could go lower than 20 with 18, and another guy went to 16, and then oil started going up again. So I think, you know, I think with oil, the worst is probably o over, but a lot of times when you see a big downtrend like this, instead of just getting a V bottom and all of a sudden going back to 60 or 70, you get a long time of of flat market consolidation. So this could go on in the lower levels for years. 
And if you look back at the financial crisis of the tech bubble, both of those sectors, financials and technologies, once they got busted, it took them decades to recover. So that could easily happen with oils too, even though it's kind of exciting now because it's so volatile. Oil's moving 5% a day, like 80% 80, 80 of the days this year. It's unbelievable. One of the interesting th things that happened recently, this chart's a little bit dated because oil's come back up, but um, back in March when oil had another downturn, the market didn't go down. And the, uh, the market had been following exactly what oil did. This is when oil started crashing, the market got killed in January. Then the market came back up when oil got a little bit better. Last time it went down in March, the, the, the stock market ignored it. So that's a, diver that's a, that's a diver divergence that's really important. And it kind of tells you that, well, the market's maybe digested this oil crisis and move beyond it. Um, so there's still some correlation, but it's not like it was earlier this year. <coughs> Moving on to gold, this is something I think the press hasn't really been talking all that much about, but they will if it continues. Gold's finally uh, made a breakout. And these, this is actually a chart of, of the gold index, so this is the gold stocks, which have done better than the, than the metal itself. But you can see an easy break in the trend line, and silver's doing the same thing. So we, we've got a reversal in trend in precious metals, which we haven't had for years. Gold's been going down since, I think, about um, 2011 or 2012. It's been a long time, three, four years anyways, in a, in a downtrend, so is silver. Platinum's doing the same thing. So the precious metals are turning, which is, you know, it's, it's not that easy to interpret, but it's important to realize a big asset class like that has finally had a trend change. And then one other thing that's, that's, that's changing is the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar was incredibly strong back in 2014 and early 2015, and then it's consolidated. And um, now it's turning down. And this is probably the most important, more important than oil or gold, I think, because um, 50, roughly 50% 50 of the standard Forest 500 companies, uh, roughly 50% of the revenues come from overseas. So those stocks have been held back because of the strong dollar. The dollar weakens, it's gonna be a big tailwind for, those, for these big companies like Johnson & Johnson and Pepsi and all the big multinationals. So, but this is an interesting change, and the reason rates, the reason the dollar's been so strong is because our rates have been relatively high compared to other countries. And um, hopefully, this would be good. I think to get some dollar dollar depreciation. This is an index uh, that that matches the dollar against the euro and, and the yen and the krona and the six six big currencies that are in, the, in this. And you can see it's how this is starting to turn down, and if it breaks down through sort of here, it's more likely they'll keep going down. And this is just the, uh, this is actually the Bloomberg dollar index, but Strategus is trend model, and you can see their trend model's gone negative on the dollar. And it's been positive for all this time, so that's, that's another big trend change. So we've got trend changes in, in oil, potentially gold, gold, silver, and the dollar, which is three big influences, and those things have only really happened in the last couple months. So that kind of leaves us where, you know, what do you do, which is the big question, and uh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that's really interesting is that the, um, the number of stocks that are out there that are yielding more than the Treasury yield right now is really elevated. So 56% of the companies in the, in the S&P 500 in the stock market will give you more return from dividends than you can get from buying Treasuries. And you can see historically that's you know, way, way up. So that just means that you know dividends relative to bonds are, are really attractive. And this is just a different way of looking at it, but this is the, this is the whole S&P 500, so that the whole S&P 500 yields more than treasuries, which is, you know, this is going back to 65. So that's a long time, and just in the last few years, we've had this phenomenon because rates are so low where you can get better return out of dividends. I think it's really important because if you look at it from the standpoint of bonds, when you buy a bond, the best thing, the best thing that can happen to you is you get your money back with interest. That's the best thing. <laughs> when you buy stocks, you've got more volatility, but if you're gonna get more return and you hold, generally if you hold for a long enough period of time, you get appreciation too. So your total return, your chances of getting a higher total return out of dividend paying stocks is way better than, than buying bonds. 
Um, this chart right here is, I think, incredibly <coughs> compelling. It goes back to the 30s and it just takes the percentage of total return in the market by decade and what's attributable to dividends from the, and the on, down here is like the average. So almost 50% of the return that's available in the stock market comes from dividends. So if you think about it, <clears throat> basically means if you can get, let's say there's a 9% return available in the stock market, half of that's from dividends. So if you, it's, it's like half the battle is won just by buying dividend stocks. It takes a lot of the risk out of the market. If you believe that that's gonna continue going forward, which I, I think a lot of people do, um, you, you, you'd almost be foolish not to buy dividend paying stocks in your portfolio because that's going to give you half of what's, what, what you're going to be able to get out of the market. And that's a long, that's a long time to have that statistic too. Um, this is just a, a slide to show that um, there's, been a, there's been a really strong outperformance in the last few years from growth stocks versus what they call value stocks. Value stocks have been in the doghouse and um, that you can see that there, you know, this peak of outperformance, this is the growth stocks minus value stocks and it shows you how much better value stocks have been doing and it's so elevated that it's pretty likely that that reverses itself. It's only happened by the time when it's gotten this high back in the late 90s. So that argues again for, for value dividend paying kind of stocks. And this is another chart that shows how the um, dividend payers versus non-payers have suffered. So the dividend payers versus non-dividend non paying stocks have been going down for, for, well, since the financial crisis really. And just recently they started to turn up. And if you look at this right here, the PE ratios for the next 12 months for companies that don't pay dividends is 17.6. Companies that do pay dividends, 15.3. So you've had this multi-year trend of dividend payers underperforming, but they're way, way cheaper they're two x, two multiples cheaper than dividend paying stocks. So again, you've got an opportunity there. Um, so that's my pitch for dividend paying stocks, and it's you know it's it's kind of it's in our wheelhouse because most of our clients own big blue chip, strong balance sheet, strong free cash flow dividend paying companies. But there's a lot of strong argument that that's a great place to be now, and, it, and for the last several years they haven't done as well. Um, so I wanted to wrap up by going through just some of the positive and negatives that we're looking at to to try to you know tell what the market's going to do. This is one of the I'm going to do the negatives first so we can get that behind us. But this is the um, the uh, annual revenues from the S and P 500. You can see that it's turned down here in 20, 2015. The jury's out in 2016. You can pretty much get any answer you want, but it's the market's going to it's going to be tough for the market to make headway if the revenue piece doesn't turn back up a little bit. If this goes down in 2016, I think we're going to stay in you know, the very best of trading range and maybe have some weakness. But that's probably the primary reason that the market's been so choppy for the last uh, year or so. And this is maybe a, a bigger negative concern. Um, operating margins have turned down. And you can see if you look at it on this basis with the tech bubble, financial crisis, uh, margins turned way down. I don't think that's going to happen again, but it's definitely a red flag. So um, we need to, we've had a lull in productivity in the United States uh, in the last couple of years, and it's it's way below what it usually is. So if it picks back up, which I think it probably will, this, this number will get better, but um, that's got to at least stabilize, I think, for, for better forward progress. Companies just aren't being able to you know, they don't have as much pricing power, they just can't get quite as much margin as they were getting, even though it was pretty elevated. Um, there's also just a couple, you know, you all this, this is noisy, but the, the stock market as a percentage of the gross domestic product is elevated. Um, this is one of the things that Warren Buffett looks at and he thinks is a red flag, because if you have the market values uh, amplified versus our GDP, it's you know, it's, a, it's possibly a sign of overvaluation. So that's that's another negative. Can you go to the next slide, And this is just margin debt. How much people are borrowing to buy stocks. This is again, tech bubble, financial crisis, and now. So those are that can be worrisome. This interest rates are so low. I think people are borrowing a lot more money to buy stocks. As you, can, you know, it's almost 
it's very, very cheap to, to leverage your stocks. We don't really do that here at all, but um, it's still a concern because if there's a if there's a dip in the market for whatever reason, margin leverage can cause that to be exacerbated on the downside. So those are kind of the negatives. Um, the positives are that um, on a valuation basis, the market isn't you really it would be hard pressed to make an um, argument that the market is expensive. One of the things when you look at PE ratios is that you really need to relate it to the price of money, to interest rates. So this chart shows you that when we're in the range, we are now basically zero to two percent uh, interest rates. We're at one seven now. The, the historical PEs have been about seventeen point nine. So in that earlier slide I showed where the dividend paying stocks are at 15.6 or whatever it was. Actually, the market's maybe a little bit cheap on a PE basis. So we don't have a valuation issue like we had in 2000 with the tech bubble where things were trading at 100 times sales. We've got a nice solid multiple. So that's a good underpinning for the market and particularly for dividend paying stocks. Um, unemployment, I know everybody's heard about this, but th these are unemployment claims and obviously they're, they're way, way down. So. This is you know, considering that we're a consumer-oriented society and 70-something percent of our GDP comes from consumers. More people are working, they're going to spend more, so consumers are going to be able to continue to drive the economy. And uh, I think this is this has dropped fast, but it's really probably got some lags before the spending really hits and people get jobs and they, they want to feel comfortable that they're not going to lose their job again and they start spending more. Um, and this is one chart I want to put in because I, I think a lot of people don't realize this. This government spending and, and contribution to gross domestic product historically has been much higher. And then this is the um, austerity stuff we went through. It wasn't really austerity, it was just less acceleration in spending, but call it austerity. But there was, it was a drag. The government spending component of GDP was a drag. And now it's re-accelerating. Re partly because of the election. Everybody wants to get reelected, so they're spending like crazy. But um, a lot of people think this this will help defense stocks a lot because defense spending has been way down. With new administration coming down, it's probably going to go up. Um, but that's pr likely to contribute maybe as much as um, maybe up to half a percent of GDP, which is a huge boost. So government spending is, is now is going from a negative the last four years to a, a positive. And that's historically been a good thing for the stock market, too. Uh, one other little thing that maybe a lot of people don't realize is the number of stocks that are listed on the exchanges has shrunk dramatically. So back in, just before the, the decade, there was 8,800 stocks on the market. Now there's 5,300, probably even less than that now. This is because of mergers, acquisitions, buyouts, whatever, but there's a huge shrinkage. So if you think about it from the standpoint of money chasing the same number of stocks, there's a lot less supply out there. And that's <coughs> that could be bullish if there's for any any um, buying that might come in. A lot of people think that when interest rates do start to go up, all this money is going to come out of bonds. You're looking for a place to go. Where's it going to go? Dividend paying stocks. And there's less of them out there, so they'll probably tend to move up more than they would have historically when there was more supply. Um, and the other thing, I put China last, this is the last slide, but I, I put this last because it's, I, I think, a real two-edged sword. This was a big issue earlier in the year when everybody was, China was completely imploding. And the issue is that China, the forecast for their GDP is obviously decelerating, which isn't that surprising considering the size of their economy. Um, and it would be you know, unbelievable if we could get this kind of GDP number. They're not bad, but relative to where they've been, that worries people. And I think the issue is that China's economic data that they put out is so opaque. Most of it's just fake, I think. Nobody really knows. And um, so it's, it's nerve-wracking when, when everybody starts talking about China rolling over and maybe going down for a while. But they're not going down. It's just a decrease in their growth rate. And the reason this is a two-edged sword is because the, econo the economy is the second biggest in the world next to ours now. So if these numbers are actually coming worse, it's going to affect the whole world. But on the other hand, if they're better, and they can do a lot over there to juice it because they've got so much money, um, then it's a it's a huge, you know, the news two months from now is that China's growing much faster than everybody thought they were. 
it will be a huge uh, mm -hmm. boost for the stock market, for the U.S. market. So the China, the jury's really out on China, what's going on there, but likely slowing down, but not to the point where it's any sort of disaster. Still good growth. And I think that's all I've got. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, the conclusion is, I think that the, the market isn't particularly overvalued. Um, it's not great. It's not cheap. But if you if you you have to really look in certain spots to try to pick, it's like a stock picker's market. There's certain things that look very overvalued, certain things that look cheap. But probably the easiest path to success, if you're a, a, a sort of a buy and hold, you know, longer term investor, is to buy blue chip stocks that pay you dividends and have decent growth prospects. Put them away and hold them, and not worry about the day to day volatility that we've got, because eventually it'll smooth out, like it always does. So I think that's I think that's pretty much what's going on, and um, watch carefully in the next few days because we're at this inflection point where markets probably either get beat back or break out and start making new highs again. <coughs> so does anybody have any questions? I know it's a lot of pictures, but <laughs> that's kind of the question. scenario. Yep. Uh, so you've shown historical charts, but. See nothing about how the political climate has influenced the market over the years. Yeah. As far as what's we've got a big event happening. Yeah, I purposely left that out because I didn't want to go there in terms of politics. <laughs> but, but it's oh, a great question, and I think it's it's a uh, market. Right? Yeah, it does, and, and you know who knows how. Um, I, I think it's probably safe to say there's stark choices this year, and uh, and the market is maybe more upset by that. It's probably one of the reasons we've had some of the more chaotic movements. Um, but I don't really, I've never seen anything historically that gives any, any solid grasp on what to expect. And you see charts on what happens, with, you know, what happens to the market in a year where the, there's a lame duck president and that kind of thing. Um, there, there's <coughs> there's gonna be a lot of turnover in the Senate this year, probably more than historically by three or four seats. Um, but I don't, I've never seen anything that, that you can really get to any conclusion on. To tell you the truth, that's why I didn't. I mean, maybe you have, but I, I it's it's chaos out there, and the only thing I would say is that, and this isn't a partisan statement, sort of is, but the uh, you know, U.S. industry is sort of being regulated out of business now. It's just incredible what what's happening, and um, it's incremental, but it's costing companies a lot more to do business and whatever the next regime is hopefully the regulatory environment will become a little more friendly because it's so onerous now and it's getting worse every day um, I'll give you an example a client of mine has a manufacturing business and um, he hasn't had an OSHA violation in seven years an OSHA guy he had an employee who had their, cut his finger a little bit on a machine he was out for a half a day he cut his finger off or anything like that but the OSHA guy came in he looked at their stuff and there was a, he didn't like one guard on one of their machines. There was a guard on it, but he didn't think it was big enough. He wanted it two inches longer. He fined him $60,000. And, and um, my friend said, you know, why, where did that number come from? They, basically, they can arbitrarily find you whatever they want. And he said OSHA is self, has to be self-funding now. So these, these goons are going around just to every plant and they're just going, you pay this, you pay that. And it's, you know, that's just one example of all these regulations. So politically, I think that's one big thing that hopefully will happen. This regulatory environment's gotta become more friendly. We've got the highest corporate tax rate in the, in the developed world. If, I firmly believe that if we lowered corporate taxes from 35 to 25, the like 10 points, the market would explode. We'd all make a ton of money. The market would go vertical. Because how can we compete with the rest of the world when we're when we're shelling out all that money for taxes. It's impossible. So maybe that's more hopeful that you know whatever regime we get is more business friendly, but I don't think it can get much more unfriendly than it's been for the last number of years. Did the uh, Fed make, take any action that, that brought the, the dollar down? What was the forces that brought the value of the dollar down? The, that's a great question because the Fed has been the Fed has been um, waffling, <laughs> saying one thing, then they remember back in uh, 
late last year they were going to raise rates, raise rates, mm -hmm. raise rates, and it was data dependent, so supposedly, but they kind of painted themselves in a corner where they had to raise rates, which they did in December. Look what happened to the market in January. It's like mm -hmm. went straight down, and then they kind of pulled back, and now now uh, Janet Yellen has been making dovish statements. So they didn't actually do anything policy-wise. It was hard. They just sort of said, well, maybe we won't raise rates now. But I think the problem is that they're giving so many mixed signals. If you look at the if you look at the news every day, you know the Fed the Fed guy in Philly says one thing, the Fed guy in San Francisco says another thing. They're all one of them says they want to raise rates, one, and nobody they're, they're just giving mixed signals. And for the biggest central bank in the world to be doing that is kind of silly. Um, so Janet Yellen hopefully needs to sort of get control of the Fed and just speak with one voice instead of having all these people around that want to. I don't know, make a name for themselves or whatever they're trying to do. The person in Cleveland hasn't been too vocal, luckily. But the market's listening, listening mostly to her. I think so, but it's disconcerting when you know one of these guys says, "Well, you know, I want to, I want to raise rates three more times this year or whatever." So um, it's just, it's much easier, I think, if the Fed is giving a, a solid message to the markets rather than sort of flapping in the wind, and that's what they've been doing. They lost some credibility, I think. You have the stronger economy in the West Coast, San Francisco business is very strong. Mm -hmm. Ohio business or Northeast Ohio business is certainly not. Yeah. And that reflects what you're, with all the dialogue. Yeah, I think so. I think that's probably true. But in the old days, they didn't, um, you know, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve was sort of the mouthpiece. Remember, the Greenspan was always, whatever he was saying, nobody ever knew, but he was the guy who talked. <laughs> now they're all, all the sort of underlings, the 12 governors, or how many they are, are talking all the time, and they're contradicting themselves. So, um, yeah, I don't know if it'll change or not, but it's not, I don't think it's pretty really good for the market, in, at least in the short term, because you can have a day where the market's up, maybe, and all of a sudden a couple of Fed guys come out, and they're just being randomly interviewed, and they say, well, I think we should raise rates two more times, and psh, takes the wind out of the sails. So it's just it's just not good to have a erratic message from the Fed, I don't think. And it didn't used to happen. Yeah. Do, do you have any data on the rate of dividend increases versus the rate of earning increases? Uh, you mean the expected rate for the next few years? Well, no, I, I'm kind of feeling that dividend rate is going up faster than companies' earnings are. Um, I, I don't have anything off the top of my head, but I'm sure we could find something like that. It's, I, I think you're right. I think dividend increases have been stronger than earning increases later, uh, lately. Um, part of that's because um, the payout ratios um, are, are relatively low compared to history, I think because <coughs> of the double taxation. But um, there's, a, you know, people are, there's this thirst for yield that's been out there for years now. Right. So people are, you know, you know, the, the, the C-suite guys know that they need to start paying more dividends if they want to attract capital. And the other thing would be um, the amount of stock buybacks, companies purchasing their own stock and, yep. in recent years versus previous years. Yep. Um, it's slowing down now. I don't know, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, but the buybacks have been sort of all the rage. They've gotten a lot of negative press. I happen to think buybacks are great. It's just another way of returning capital to shareholders. Um, but uh, it, for whatever reason, the, you know, the media is against it. But um, recently, the buyback craze has sort of slowed down a little bit. I don't know if that means it's going to keep slowing down or not. But it's a good tool. Um, but the argument is that the reason companies are doing it is because they don't know what else to do with their money. They don't. They don't want their. The economy is not good enough. They don't have enough um, faith in the administration that they want to they want to make big capital investments. So that's been sort of holding really holding back the economy. So you know these guys they have to do something with their money. They don't necessarily want to invest it because they're not they, the landscape's too uncertain. Well, on that buybacks, I mean, if if you're in a company and you own the company and they're buying it back then obviously, I mean, that's good. Mm -hmm. You can increase earnings per share. But if you're not in a name and you're buying it, you're actually competing with, uh, they're, they're making a market in the stock, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, and there's no, I don't think there's any uh, good history that shows that these guys are necessarily buying their stock at bargain prices either. There's a lot of buybacks 
where you know six months later the stock's a lot lower. So, but whenever they go out and buy, uh, you know, I, I understand. I just kind of learned recently that they apparently closed out of buying first thing in the morning, last thing in the day for a half hour. That's what I heard. Yeah. But other than that, is there any way to get an idea? You know, when they're buying, how do they buy? Do they just go out there and buy two two hundred shares at a time, or? <laughs> You know. Yeah, I, I I don't know what all the regulations are, and what, you know, they're win you know, they have certain windows when they can buy. There's certain black blacked out times where, if you're an insider, where you can't buy, you know, personally. But for corporate buying, I don't really know what the mechanics are to tell you the truth. Um, I don't think they're buying small amounts at a time. No. But um, you know, most of them most of them announce these big buyback amounts that they set aside, and then they can you know for the next year. And then run it down, and then they have a board meeting, and they decide they want to add more to that. So it's generally picked as been, um, you know, received as a positive for stocks, but lately that's sort of lost some of its luster. So I think it's a positive. I like to have. I mean, there's actually there's actually exchange traded exchange traded funds that do nothing but buy companies that are buying back their stock, and they've done pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? If you have anything, any tough questions, ask Gary. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, thanks for Thank it. Thank okay. Thank Just a quick um, comment. We, we have a uh, event on May 2nd. Tw uh, 12th? Is that right, Mindy? May 12th. May 12th, which is uh, our next Carnegie College, but it's actually going to be an evening event. Starts at 5.30, but uh, Ken Malin, who's a pretty well-regarded local economist, is uh, our guest speaker. So um, I encourage you to, if, you, if you're available, to, to attend that. I think it's going to be a good, a good one. So um, other than that, uh, we're handing out surveys and I appreciate your feedback, and um, we'll be around to answer any questions and have a chat. Thank you.